Select Center for History and New Media. It's a live edition of the Digital Campus Podcast. Applause <laughs> signs are lit, and we're excited to have a great and very large and intimidating audience with us here today um, for the 70th edition of the Digital Campus Podcast. This week, brought to you by Grad Hacker. Grad Hacker. A new website <laughs> featuring advice uh, on hacking graduate life at gradhacker.org and on Twitter at gradhacker, gradhacker for all your grad hacking needs. <laughs> Is that good? Thanks. Okay, get that get out of there. Okay, checks in the mail. Yeah. Welcome yes. to the podcast. I'm Dan Cohen, for those uh, who don't know me. Um, and I'm here with the regulars, Amanda French to my right. Hi, Dan. Hi Amanda. Tom Scheinfeld. Hi, everybody. And Mills Kelly. Welcome. So we've never had a live audience. How many people actually listen to this podcast on a regular basis? OK, great. It's wonderful to actually see our audience. Um, and um, we're excited to get started here. Uh, we are taking, for people watching on Ustream, um, we are still taking requests for what we're going to talk about. If you just um, send us a reply or a mention on Twitter, we will be sure to get it. And I'll do my best to work it into conversation at Digital Campus. Um, so we're going to start today with a discussion of the Georgia State case. Um, if I remember correctly, it's Cambridge, Oxford, and Sage Presses have sued Georgia State University to um, get redress for um, offenses made by the university in terms of copyright law. Um, it could have an enormous impact. Um, it's something that I think our audience should follow very carefully because it basically involves what they can do in terms of digital course reserves and whether we'll be able to uh, assign more than a thousand words of any article from now on, a thousand books. Mills, have you been following this and I know something more than I do about it? I, I've been following this one and I think it's just, I think it's gonna be one of those moments that we look back at later and say, oh yeah, that's when all, all the wheels came off because the, the essence of the lawsuit is that, uh, what, that anyone putting uh, readings, copyrighted material on an e-reserve will be, if the presses are successful, will be limited to a thousand words. And uh, you know, every university has its own fair use policy, and every university has its own approach to e-reserves. Uh, you know, here at George Mason, they won't let you put the whole book on e-reserve. That would be certainly excessive. Instead, though, you know, a chapter out of a book or something like that is, is pretty common. Um, and this is clearly only for educational use. The library keeps it behind a password, only for the students in that class. And so it's, it's clearly very limited. Is it a thousand words um, without paying permission fees? It's a thousand words without paying permission right. fees. So you so could the, pay permission to right. put could, a whole chapter up. You could pay permission. Means. You could definitely pay permission. Um, and so the, the, for me, the reason I think this is a really important case uh, sort of looking forward is that I think, and why I think the wheels are going to start coming off if the presses are successful, is that if they are, what, what are we going to do? Well, we're going to stop assigning work from those presses. I mean, when was the last time Oxford University Press published a scholarly monograph as opposed to something designate, you know, destined for classroom use, but a scholarly monograph for you know, under 45 or $50? And it's been a long time. And so I'm, you know, I'm very conscious of how much money my students have to spend for the university and for housing, and, and in addition to that, for all the, you know, all the readings that we assign. And so I try to assign things that keep them, you know, that, that keep them focused on the really important issues in the scholarship but at the same time, it's some kind of a reasonable cost. So I'm always balancing between the books I require them to buy and, and the material that I put on e-reserve. Well, I'm just gonna stop putting things from these presses on e-reserve and, and from everybody if it's a thousand words because that's not helpful to me. So instead, what am I gonna do? I'm gonna find the things that are copyright clear. I'm gonna find the things that are in you know, some kind of open access form. And, and so for me, what's gonna happen is the presses are gonna, they're killing themselves in doing this, and I think it's just, it's a complete misunderstanding of the business model for their business going forward. I mean, that's that's my my take on all of this, is this just shows, I think this is some of the best evidence we've had of just how broken the university press model is. I mean, get this, the University of Oxford and the University of Cambridge are suing Georgia State University because students and faculty at Georgia State University want to read Stuff produced 
by the University of Oxford and Cambridge. I mean, isn't that the point of those presses? I mean, isn't the point of those universities to to disseminate knowledge, to 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 enrich uh, to enrich education? I mean, isn't what? Why do they exist then? If that's not what they're there for, I, I think they just need to go away. I mean, they need to get out of the way. And I think that this is the outgrowth too of university presses having been treated as uh, independent units, right? And university presses now are functioning like trade presses. They are supposed to make money, right? And so in order to do that, they get as paranoid as any for-profit organization about, about covering their costs and making money. So. It's kind of sad to see the, the Chronicle had a good uh, forum um, in which they asked several people to, to write in and um, talk about you know, their feelings about this case. And I thought that the saddest one was the university press folks trying to defend the fact that they're reselling back to faculty stuff they've gotten for free. Um, all the, you know, peer review has been done for it for free. They're selling it back and they're trying to sort of justify this in a moral way. And I was at this meeting yesterday, I think I tweeted this line from someone who was there who was saying that um, hell hath no fury like a vested interest masquerading as a moral principle. And I thought that was such a great explanation for this, for this comment of sort of somehow this is, um, you know, a moral thing that we're keeping scholarly publishing alive and, you know, if we didn't do this, then all hell would break loose. And I think particularly in this age, in a digital age where we've got these alternatives in terms of open access, open publishing, that um, you know, it's not like there there can't be forms of publication that that are alternatives. The question I have, and I'd be interested to hear from the audience too, is whether this will hasten, as Kevin Smith from Duke said in that forum, hasten the acceleration of open access publishing. And I'm kind of skeptical. I mean, my realist side says probably not. You know, I mean, we've been talking about this on the podcast for four years, and. Um, there's just a system in place where the incentives are to publish in these more dated forums because they have the brands, et cetera. Um, I don't know how others feel about this. Um, I agree with you that it probably will not hasten the open access publishing. Um, well, number one, I don't think I don't think the publishers are going to get what they ask for. I mean, I just don't think that's going to go through. What's amazing is that, that so there's no if it faculty. Did, I mean, it might hasten open access, but I don't think. I think in this room are 50% of the scholars in the United States who even know or care about this case. Right. Yeah, probably. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we talk to our colleagues in the department. They, they haven't heard about this. They, they couldn't care. And that yet this you know, potentially catastrophic event could occur in which what's even more comical is this thousand word limit comes from these legal debates in the 70s, basically around fair use, that were tossed out, that were written into law in the late 70s as they were not included. They left the standard to make. George is about to explode over here, so we're going to go. <laughs> well, I, if I could just say one thing about, the, about, about sort of traditional faculty. I think they will, if, if, if this lawsuit is successful, um, you know, they will become quickly aware of the problems with this because there's, on every campus, there's going to be some entity that's going to be checking their syllabi to make sure they're not assigning anything that violates these these guidelines, and so when you try to assign a, a, a book chapter and you're told you can't, you you'll know. Well, and then just people are going to make end runs around it anyway. I mean, a lot of us run our course websites right. off campus. I think increasingly there's a commercialization or a consumerization of technology on the campus where we're using Amazon Web Services and WordPress and all these places, and stuff will just leach out around the system. It just doesn't make a lot of sense to me. I, I think that I, I actually think that it's going to accelerate um, open publishing because, um, first of all, it's getting as we all know, it's getting harder and harder and harder to publish that first monograph anyway, um, and so there's been a, a push, especially from younger scholars, to get at, you know get some other system than this gated process that we all had to live with, um, and but secondly, I think where you will see the acceleration is in the second book. I think that people will still continue for a while anyway to publish with the major university presses because their tenure requirements say they need some kind of branding. But uh, but then there's no incentive after that. 
there's absolutely no incentive after the first book. And so I think that's where the presses are going to see the real loss initially is that, that people are going to stop publishing their second books like that because it's just too easy to do it another way. And you know, the first book there, you know, you wrote your dissertation, you did all this work, you want to you, you get that job, you want to get tenure, you want to you have all these clear incentives. After that, there's just not the clear incentive anymore. That, and so the real purpose of further books after the first one is to circulate knowledge as rapidly as possible to as many people who will benefit from it and engage in a conversation with you. And you can do that in an open way where you can't do it if it's a thousand words at a time. I mean, and I'd like to point out too that, you know, when we're talking about e-reserves, there, I, work, I was working in e-reserves at Emory, just down the road from um, Georgia State University when this case first broke, when it was you know, first sued. And Emory had just put into place a policy of uh, being really careful about e-reserves. So they, they set aside $25,000 in the budget, and I think that they had to up it after that to pay to the Copyright Clearance Center. I mean, essentially it was like, well, we've been doing all this, and we haven't been paying anything, and now we're gonna start paying $25,000 a year, at least, for stuff that we've been doing already. Um, we, you know, I did some statistics about who was using e-reserves, and let's be clear, e-reserves means stuff that's already owned by that, by that university library, all right? Get your, get your mind around that for a minute, you know? Okay, so the, the university's library has already paid for a print copy of this book or whatever, Several faculty want to have a chapter or different chapters from that put up online in a central place, and the, our library did that as a service. You say lots of people do it differently. So only 30 to 40 percent were, of faculty were using e-reserves. I am certain that a whole bunch of other faculty were making PDFs of stuff and putting them up on Blackboard, which had nothing to do with e-reserves at all. And we were talking about, well, can we build software that will make everybody have to go through our e-reserve system in order to, so that we can build in some copyright checking, um, you know, before Blackboard emerged, it was just like a technical problem that was too hard to solve. But actually, when the Georgia State case broke, it was, it was kind of like, phew, it's a good thing we set aside this 25K because, you know, we just, <laughs> we had been doing more or less what they were doing. Well, and I think the example of Emory and Georgia State is a really good one because let's, let's say that, that the suit is successful. Well, Emory can then afford yeah. to pay this. Georgia State cannot, yeah. and and so what the you know what another implication of this is that the elite universities are going to be able to pay these kinds of fees, and in, in that forum, um, you know one of the examples was a course pack from a government class in Harvard. The course pack cost four hundred and fifty dollars, and okay, Harvard could help their students in some way if necessary with that, but uh, you know the <laughs> Georgia State, George Mason. The, the sort of mass market universities around the country cannot. And so, so then you have a situation where students attending elite universities have access to material, students attending non-elite universities don't. And that's a huge problem. Okay, have we beaten the horse dead yet? <laughs> no. 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 I mean, it, it, or my vibration started in about 1997 when Ed Fox started the electronic thesis and dissertation program at Virginia Tech University. And they thought that they had a way of allowing students who had non-traditional media, meaning not just paper and pictures, as part of their thesis or dissertations, to create these digital. And what they ran into was not the presses, but they ran into the professional organizations like you know, the math, the science, you know, the chemistry association, that if they were to do this, it would be viewed as prior publication, and they couldn't even print their first book, okay? So they've had various boycotts already, and I think you're gonna have to get buy-in from a very large community to make this happen. We're getting a little hate from the Twitter um, uh, from Ian uh, Bogus. Hi, Ian. Hi, Ian. Um, and you know, he's talking about us navel gazing and, and viable alternatives. I think it is a good question. I think maybe you know the question is, let's say there is a point, uh, which will be a point where a lot of PR will will, will happen on both sides. But 
The question is, at that point, let's say Georgia State loses the case, are there actually viable alternatives, right? And I think we've thought a lot about, at, actually at several of that camps, about potential viable alternatives for producing high quality scholarship that happen in open access ways, that have sustainable models. Um, we don't have time to get into that here, but I think that is, I think that's absolutely a relevant question. Um, I hope we haven't been staring at our navel too much. And there is, a, I, th I think there's a session that's been proposed for tomorrow, the next day on, um, on, 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 on presses. Press. Yeah. So I mean, you know, there there is, I, I, but I do think I do think the criticism is, is is right. Like, if we're, I think what I take from it is that if we're going to complain about this, we need to get out there and start providing those alternatives. Sure. I don't think we can let the university presses, the AUP, you know, like try to do this for us. Um, I think I think we're going to have to take some initiative. Right, and I just think it's a great case where. Let's say George State loses the, the case completely. If there was, let's say, a press like Berkeley Electronic Press, which already exists, has a business model, does open access journals, sells them to libraries on a subscription basis, if they were to say, hey, you can port your whatever journal on topology from a gated uh, journal, I mean, when the contract's up with Cambridge or Oxford or Sage, you can port it over to us. We're going to make it open access. Anyone can use it freely. They can appeal to the board, the editorial board, of, and the scholarly society that supports that journal as an alternative. I think that's a case where, you know, there'll be a moment of, I think, really reckoning for, for those things and whether faculty, I think, care enough to perhaps move it to alternative venues. But it's going to be hard for those organizations, though. I mean, the thing is that it's, it's so easy to sign with Oxford because they're just, you know, they say, we'll take care of it all for you. You know, don't worry about any of this. Like, we'll just... We'll, we'll give you the website, we'll give you, we'll do the whole thing. Um, and, you know, doing something different requires the membership of the organization, the board of the organization, the executive committee, and the executive director of the organization to, you know, put real work and thought and time into, into how this is gonna work. And, um, but I think that's gonna have to happen if, if we're, we end up with results like we're facing here. Well, we had a meeting this week with uh, our author development rep about some of the work we've been doing and how we can work with them. And she said that more and more of the presses are, they don't actually, Oxford doesn't do everything for you. Oxford wants you to put up your own website for the book, mm -hmm. do your, your own marketing. And so that's one of the, as presses contract more and more, they actually don't do that. The only advantage, or one key advantage of signing with Oxford is it's Oxford. And I mean, that's the big one. Yeah, you know, I think we, also Chris, do we need to repeat questions from the audience or are we picking them up? Hurt. It uh, wouldn't hurt. Uh, we picked up him, but it wouldn't hurt to. Yeah, I mean, the question is actually how much these universities' pre presses do um, uh, at the end of the day. They're doing less and less. I mean, it's been a long time since they did things like indexes, and now they don't. If you want to do an author's blog or something like that, a lot of that's on you well. And it's, well. A, it's a vicious circle for them because they get, I mean, Oxford and Cambridge being perhaps a bit of an exception, but other university presses, um, they get less money, and so they don't have as many people and can't offer as many services, you know, and that's where the, the value kind of goes away, but they get less money because I think people are saying, well, everything's on the internet, and, you know, I don't even know why university presses are being defunded to the extent that they are. Um, but. I think at the end of the day, it's, I mean, like a lot of these things, it's not a technical question, it's a social, cultural question. And it's a brand question. I mean, I think a lot of this revolves around the power of the brand and the difficulty of overco overcoming brand, um, uh, the brand stamp on something like a book, right? Um, and you know, I think that's the question. Actually, a lot of the really interesting literature is actually from economics on this of how brands erode over time. But one of the ways brands erode is from PR disasters like something like the Georgia State case, where people right. who were formerly not caring about an issue or didn't realize the system yeah. suddenly realize or, or start learning about the way the university publishing system happens. And I think that's where you start to get into a point where there can be a shift. And I, you know, your earlier comment about um, vested interests um, masquerading as moral, a moral principle, I'm, I'm probably included in that category as well. <laughs> 
but my vested interest when I'm teaching a university class is I need to do my job. I mean, I get a kind of moral outrage about this. My job is to share information with these students. They're already paying a huge amount of tuition. I mean, if it's a question of e-reserves, the, libra the library already owns that book. Um, you know, I am trying to do my job. I'm trying to share information with the students. That's it. And if you're putting obstacles in my way, I'm going to be angry. <laughs> OK. I think we should move on. Sherman Dorn on Twitter is asking where the devil's advocate is. Um, he's under the table. I, I'll, 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 I'll say, I'll even, I'll even take a little devil's advocate one. position. One, one thing that these universities say is that, well, you guys were paying permissions for printed course packs, which is true. Um, I think that, but again, it's a case where the technology makes, you don't have to, you know, it's useful for each student to have a printed copy of that article, right? But if you can put it online, well, they can each print that out, right? I mean, the, there's no technological reason for, um, for us to make the, the printed course packs anymore. I don't know. It's. Um, I, I think that I would actually say too. There's. There is. I, I am. There's probably not much question that Georgia State professors did infringe, as I understand it. You know, I'm not a lawyer, um, but it looks like you know what they were doing was, you know, okay. Yes, it's infringement probably within the legal definition of fair use, but does that definition go far enough? Probably not. And again, it's like this whole ambiguity about what a classroom is because there's a classroom exception, right? Except these feel like virtual classrooms. Like if you've got a blackboard or whatever, you know, that feels like your class. Well, it's not actually your classroom. It's a, web, it's a website, which is a publication, and so you're not allowed to republish it. You know, it's just a mess. Okay. Um, we're still taking uh, topics via Twitter, so if you just add us, um, I will try to work it in. Someone had a question, actually, I'd forgotten about this, about Google getting out of the newspaper digitization. Oh, yeah. Any, any thoughts on that? <laughs> um, I, I have a tiny little thought. Um, listeners to the podcast will know that I've um, been following the Digital Public Library of America project very closely. Um, my only tiny point about Google getting out of the digitization business was that a few people on the DPLA listserv were saying, hey, maybe this is something the DPLA can take over, um, is doing some digitization of newspapers. I don't think that's going to fly, but it was a, it was a suggestion. Well, and the NEH has been funding the digitization. Yeah, right. The, the, first the microfilming and now the digitization of newspapers for, I don't know, 10, 12 years. People pointed that out as well. They were like, there are people digitizing yeah. newspapers. Uh, my, my thought is this, this is this is the danger of relying on a commercial interest to, to do this work for us. Um, you know, they decide one day, yeah, not making money for us. Just, you know, we can increase shareholder profits by, you know, dividends by a penny if we get rid of this. and. They get rid of it, um, and so you know when we say when we rely on Google to do you know to digitize books um, and to do those kinds of things, um, you know we have to we have to know what we're getting into. These are commercial these are commercial operations. They have their own interests. Um, they have to do what's right for their shareholders legally, morally even, and uh, and that's what they're going to do. Um, and those interests aren't always going to be our interests. The other slightly irrelevant thought I had about that, um, not having had time to read much in the news lately is um, there's a great book by Nicholson Baker called Double Fold, which often, um, I know we've got people here from the Library of Congress and librarians, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a slightly anti-library book, um, but I love it nonetheless, and, and that book is actually about um, how, uh, it, it's about how newspapers need to be digitized um, on one level. Um, it, it goes, um, it tells the story of microfilming of newspapers, and how libraries were very keen to jump on the microfilming bandwagon, which again was take, was was done by by private companies, um, and that because all the newspapers were on microfilm and libraries wanted to save space, many libraries started throwing away newspapers to the point where, whoops, um, entire runs of obscure newspapers um, were no longer to be found physically and were only to be found on microfilm. Which, if you've ever done a lot of microfilm reading, you know, there are, there are errors in the scanning and it's black and white, right? I mean, there were some beautiful color processes even in the 19th century, which people don't even know about. So um, at any rate, book recommendation, double fold. You know, when I, when I think about Google doing things or not doing things, I, I actually think not in terms of profits because 
they clearly do a lot of things yeah, they do. that are not profitable. Um, but I actually think their driving force is, can we get useful data out of the project? I actually think the book scanning project, one of the hidden stories is there's actually a lot of useful data from it. Um, there's useful data for translation, automated translation, for instance, because they will have parallel copies of books that haven't been co-scanned before. Um, whereas a lot of machine translation used to use just the United Nations transcripts, which are transla translated, or the Bible, or things like that. So there are reasons to do that. I think there were reasons to do Google 1-800-GOOG-411, their uh, service that they recently stopped, because they had gotten enough uh, voice recordings to be able to do really high quality um, voice analysis. And I suspect that just newspapers are just uninteresting from a data perspective, but I, I may be wrong about that. I, I, mean, I bet I, they're, also, they're also much harder, harder to, you know, like, right. I mean, like when a front page says, continued on page 814, you know, column three, um, what does a computer do with that? You know, it's, it's very difficult to, it's not just a, a book that has, that goes all the way through, um, probably, it's just harder to, to then put all that information in, in a database that can be, be useful and usable by, you know, by a, by a machine. Right. Okay, good question. Um, thank you for, for that. Um, schema.org uh, came out this week, um, and people can check that out at schema.org, um, surprisingly. <laughs> um, and uh, I repeat myself. Um, and uh, sort of an interesting attempt by three unlikely partners, right? It is Bing slash Microsoft, Yahoo, and Google, all trying to, for what seems to me like the umpteenth time, advance some kind of uh, structured data schema for the web so that their search engines can crawl websites and pick up information that is not encoded. I mean, this is a problem we've run into in a, in a lot of ways. Um, for instance, in our Zotero project about bibliographic data, very hard to acquire from web pages because it's not often in structures form, structured formats on a web page. Um, there have been a lot of these things around. There's the mic, I think microformats.org has been around forever. Um, there have been other things like in bibliographic records, um, coins, which is the context object in span tags, which is a way to put in bibliographic information into a span tag in HTML. But this seems like it's got a lot of uh, weight behind it. Um, what do people think of this? I mean, I'm, I'm kind of of two minds. I mean, um, I, I, when I first saw it come out, whenever I think of standards, I always think of that um, sort of joking um, aphorism of, you know, the great thing about standards is there are so many of them. Um, <laughs> and I, I couldn't decide whether it was that kind of a thing or whether with, with these companies behind it, you'd have, let's say, the Yelps of the world or maybe in our world, the archives of the world or libraries or museums encoding their web pages with this data so that someone can find a rare coin more easily through a Google search. Um, any chance of succeeding, or is this something where people just don't encode their pages with semantic information? Well, I think I, I actually think Dan, it probably speaks to your your last point. Um, it depends whether Google sees this as useful machine readable data. Um, you know, I think a lot of things at Google. I think the problem with them is, I mean, I think one of the great things about them is they kind of bubble up from the from the gra from the ground. Um, that they're, you know, twenty percent time projects. Um, I think it, it sort of depends whether this is something that like Google is really going to buy into that they use these standards across their properties, across YouTube and and Yelp and, and all of the other all of the other content properties that they own. If they, you know, if Google and Microsoft and Yahoo, all of whom own like vast portions of the of the web, um, decide to implement this across those properties, then all of a sudden it does, you know, they become standards. Like it, it is standard. And the rest of us will follow, um, but if it's just you know something, a couple of people at these companies agreed to and think is a good idea, but there's no real you know investment behind them, investment in time to, to change their their content properties, um, then then I think it's probably going to go the way of, of all these other things. Well, it doesn't rest with Google as to whether this is a success or not, really, because it really rests with individual webmasters and whether they're going to use these markup tags. Right. But they're only gonna. They're only gonna. I guess what I'm saying is, it's true. But they're only gonna lead. I mean, they're only gonna follow if somebody leads. You know. I mean, it. it it's just. You know, a million webmasters aren't gonna spontaneously. You know, 
change all their code. They will if they think it improves the search results. Well, see, that's, <laughs> that's, that's that makes it. They have these three companies yeah, have so much true. leverage, mm -hmm. and, and that's really about where your site shows up in the algorithm. Well, and I've been looking at the announcement, and it doesn't actually promise that. Doesn't look like, but I think that's implicit. But they, you've know. had these site maps, remember? I mean, Google. It's probably been seven years since they came out with site maps, um, which was a really simple uh, XML-based way of of um, essentially putting a file in your root directory for your website. We, we did it here at the center, yeah. for instance, for the 9-11 project to try to get more of our pages indexed because we found that we had 150,000 pages, but only, I think, 10,000 of them were indexed willy-nilly. And I actually like, think that worked. It, I think it did work. But that's the thing. Yeah, but the we jumped content. way up in the search Right, rates. but it's not semantic content. Right, so it's more like, here's an outline of what's on this website. If you're a spider, then here's how to get all of our stuff. Um, but th what this would enable too many them to people did that. And then you could you could register with Google that you had a site. Map. I think a lot of people do what that actually. That? Like, I think a lot of people do that. I mean, and there are whole companies you know that do SEO. And I mean, I, I have taken a few mild workshops in that, and they always say you know create a site map and that ups your search ranking and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. But I mean, like what this what this would do. Um, and I was reading a little bit about it. It says it's it's. Um, microdata, which is a balance between the extensibility of RDF and the simplicity of microformats, so it's a kind of a, you know, not quite lightweight format, but, so if you mention a person in a page, you can mark that up, like, hey, this is a person, right? And then if people were searching for that, you know, like, it, if the name of the page is the name of the person, right, that's easy enough, but if you just happen to mention a person in the page, this would make that show up right. in the search results. That did seem to be, some of the commentary was, this is an attempt to provide an alternative to um, privately held identi identity information, right? Facebook or Twitter, where there's a x.com slash Amanda French, right? Which Google has itself, right? Google profiles. Um, but where you could have on your own site, amandafrench.net or dancohen.org, you could encode that information so that that would be your, in a sense, root identity um, and so some people were sort of speculating that this was an attempt to decentralize, right, away essentially from Facebook in yeah. a lot of cases and possibly even Twitter so that you could have information flowing in a more decentralized way. I mean, uh, you know, in some ways it's, it's just like a very engineered solution and it, it strikes me, again, to the social cultural question yeah. that it's going to be hard to do unless, let's say, WordPress.com decides to encode all their pages in that way. Uh, Amazon or so, someone with a lot of data and metadata decides to just write it right yeah. into the, the software. And it, I think even if they do, I mean, it has the problems which I think we've talked about before on the on the podcast. It has you know some of the problems that are inherent in markup, in that somebody's got to do the markup, and you know it's just it, it, it requires effort, more effort on the part of the producer of the page and. It's just a question whether that, you know, is that effort going to be worthwhile? Is it gonna give, what are you gonna get for that? For yeah, that you know, we can go back and mark up, remark up all our sites at CHM. No, it's mm -hmm. just not gonna happen. Right. Um, Patrick uh, uh, Burry-John brings up on Twitter that I guess Drupal already encodes things in RDFA, if that's, if I can get a verbal confirmation. Is that, is that correct? <coughs> Yeah. yeah, and so, right, so I think, right, so Drupal is a, a good case of that. Um, WordPress would be a case where if the encoding were to happen at that level. Um, I, I don't know if people have checked out the actual schema, but, you know, it's something. Well, it's interesting because it has categories like offer, right, <laughs> which means 20% right. off. Mm -hmm. Here's that camp registration right. today only, so. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. It, I found the stuff that was at least applicable to academia to be very abstract. Um, I mean, I wouldn't be surprised you know, a if... a book is a thing. I, I felt like Philosophy 101. You know, you first, <laughs> you first specified, like, place, or, you know, <laughs> type, human creation, you know, entity, book, right? You know, that, it, was, it was of that, like, Aristotle's beginning with first principles, and I felt like, boy, that's a lot of work versus, you know, we've seen a lot of people implement coins, coins on their websites because it's just... It's sort of like a cheap, dirty hack, which often works because you just literally just stick this big, ugly span tag, and it's literally just like 
author equals Dan Kahn, and then just right there in the attributes. Um, well, at some point, know. there's going to be a next generation web, right? And I mean, the debate about <laughs> whether linked data in general or the semantic web in general has a future is ongoing, and that's always the issue. It's too much work, but it adds a lot of value. But it's too much work, but it adds a lot of value. But it's too much work, but it, you know, and it goes on like that. Right. So, but at some point, you know, the web we have today is not the web we're going to have forever. I, I'm certain of that. What we see in five or ten years, whether that's dependent on this kind of thing, yeah. rich structured data, that's certainly one direction of the web could go. But maybe it is more like um, you just get to do everything in text, and there are better search engines or better something else that isn't a search engine that does natural language processing so that all you have to do is type it in. Or it isn't even text, it's all audio and video and we've gone into a post-text society, you know. That could be it, that could be it. Yeah, I mean in some sense, I had heard yesterday for the first time about this ORCID project, O-R-C-I-D dot org, which I'm going to get the acronym wrong, but it's something like the Open Researcher's ID. Um, oh, and yeah. it, it basically just gives, I mean essentially it's sort of like an authority file, which the Library of Congress already has, if you if you've published a book, you get basically an ID from the Library of Congress specifying who you are. And, and interestingly, I sort of potentially heard that the LC might be involved with this work in some way or could maintain some master file, but it could expand out to, for instance, web publications, um, other forms of publications, which I think is interesting for this audience. I mean, obviously the main drivers are, are the sciences where, you know, there's real intense need to track people's publications and there's a lot of money around it and a lot of legal filings that universities have to do to say this is a research and this is not a research. So there's there's reasons to, to, to have it there. But I thought this was kind of an interesting idea that maybe there'd be responsible organizations or even an independent entity that would maintain authority files or linked data information about different things, about entities. Um, a lot of national libraries probably <coughs> maintain interesting URLs, sort of IDs for things. Library of Congress maintains a really interesting uh, set of IDs for concepts. See, there's actually Plato's Allegory of the Cave is actually, you can go and get an ID for that. And you can use that ID on your blog if you're talking about Plato's Allegory of the Cave. And then connect that up. Theoretically, in a, in a semantic way, you can connect that up to other things. So it may be that maybe there's responsible organizations that kind of maintain these things and make sure, um, you know, we, I, I realize it's not on our list, but there's this, you know, uh, just related thing, this push to get new bibliographic records uh, and to get beyond the MARC records that have been such a nightmare. Um, maybe this I is forgot about that. That is in, news. It might be yeah. inside baseball, but, uh, but right. I saw Deanna Markham of, of the Library of Congress yesterday. I think this is a actually a big deal also in the same area where they realize they've got this old technology that kind of is from the age of the, the uh, you know, the three by five card and the card, the physical card catalog and that they're trying to find some new way to have high quality bibliographic records that can be shared between Google and the Library of Congress and, and uh, Internet Archive. You know, is this too, is this too well, random of a topic? I, Should we I, move back to other things? So. Every librarian I know was, was all agog, uh, you know, yeah. by this or anybody involved in, you know, so the MARC record is a as you say, old, because it was so sort of pioneering at the time. It was, you know, a way to mark up a bibliographic object so that it could be shared by computers. But it dates it's from, from the 60s, I was right? going to say, yes, yeah. 60s. Well, from the 60s. And, and so they, you know, but it's become such a standard, you know, that it's going to be a big pain to replace it. But there are beginning conversations about that. In, at the ALA winter in 1991, C&I held a workshop with Sally McCallum and the Library of Congress group. Cliff Lynch was there. Peter Deutsch from Archie. Um, and then the Weiss folks and some of the other IETF folks. And it was an interesting culture clash because McCallum and LOC wanted to document in MARC records tapes. This was before the web. Um, by IP number. And that would be the permanent address. Now, how many people move their files to different machines? Everybody. And so we took two days to educate the Library of Congress 
Um, and it was a very interesting conversation. If anyone wants to know more, I'm sure, I'm sure that they've, you know, they're all over that now. You know, I think the Library of Congress is probably, I mean, you know, the MARC record is really the, the base of all kinds of, you know, it's the base of every library catalog. You know, those are all functioning on MARC records. So, you know, I don't think it's lack of knowledge that has prevented them from moving away from that in the past. It's just that it's, a, it's an enormous institution. Okay. But, Oh, I just wanted to say that the ORC ID, you know, the Open Researcher and Contributor ID, is going to be important um, to distinguish, you know, the Amanda French who's an embezzler and an ignorant Yahoo from the Amanda French who is an, a serious a, researcher, a serious accredited researcher. So say. you from the serious researcher. Hey. <laughs> you see this? Uh, so we don't have video, so video helps with tasks. There we do have video. Uh, no, I know. This yeah. is like the first time. But, uh, there we go. So we'll zoom in on that. Okay, we're going, we're going to lightning round. I just made that up. A new, new segment here on the podcast. Lightning round. <laughs> uh, question from the back. Yes. Oh, please. Yeah, I'm going to repeat the comment because it, it turns out the mic's having a little trouble picking up from that time. I think that's probably because um, um, mark record people go to school for quite a long time to learn how to make mark, mark records. Talk about you know the distinction between structured data is a lot of work, but it adds a lot of value. Librarians are willing to put in that work. I mean, you get trained as a cataloger and you put a lot of information in that records, and it's very, very, very structured. You, you know, um, there certainly are um, glitches, but you know, on the whole. There's a lot of information there, and it's easy to transfer. Okay. Um, thanks for the further comments on, on Mark Records. Um, okay, lightning round. Any any quick topics you'd like us to, to discuss, or that you'd like to discuss? Any from people viewing on this uh, camera that's sitting in front of us? <laughs> I want to discuss um, Creative Commons licenses on YouTube. Anybody yeah, else? You just announced? No, no, greatest no. day in my life. Creative Commons on YouTube. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so the Steve Ramsey agrees. Um, big mm -hmm. news. YouTube is finally going to um, put Creative Commons like allow users to um, specify Creative Commons um, licensing for videos that they upload, um, which is great. Flickr has had this for a while, and this means that YouTube videos you'll now know whether you're allowed to use them and mix them up. In you know, heck, even if, if we are talking about the GSU case earlier, if we, if more scholars even put um, Creative Commons licenses on their work on the web, that would be, that would be useful. I see, um, I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled about it too, but I do see a whole lot of copyrighted content um, <laughs> being released <laughs> by third parties under <laughs> Creative Commons licenses on YouTube. I mean, you're gonna run into, you're gonna do a Creative <laughs> Commons search and you're gonna find, you know, the Prince video and, the, and you know and the Disney movie. It's funny, I see that on YouTube too. People put up like a clip from some TV show that they clearly don't have the rights to put up. And what they'll do is they'll say in the comments, like, "I'm not trying to infringe on anyone's copyright. I'm not claiming any ownership." And it's like it's too late. It's infringed, you know. And then I watch it and I go away happy. <laughs> uh, I mean, in some sense, it's, I, I hate to get serious again back to this Georgia State thing, but. It's very interesting to see these alternative systems where the default is for sharing, right? And I think when, when um, you know, there's currently a flame war going on here in the Twitters um, uh, about the what we said about university presses, but I think it's very interesting to think about systems where, yeah, surprising, yeah, <laughs> it's lighting up my, uh, my tweet deck here. Um, but but I, I think it's interesting to, to look at systems where the default is 
a Creative Commons license, and then what happens to that material? I mean, how is it used in the classroom? I know Mills, you use a lot of YouTube videos. Um, you know, I, I was looking at uh, recently, University of Pennsylvania does a mashup contest every year where they have students uh, mash up video, mostly from YouTube. And this sort of enables that kind of secondary creativity. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, YouTube is becoming so ubiquitous uh, for teaching purposes that, that having things available through Creative Commons is gonna, I think, gonna facilitate that. I, I, don't think, I don't think university faculty members are worried about when they gonna sh you know, if they're gonna show a YouTube video in their classroom. I don't think it even occurs to them to think, hmm, I wonder if this is a copyright infringement or not. Instead, they say, oh, look, there's that video of uh, you know, the, the United Nations General Assembly I need, and they put it up on right. the screen, a and that's gonna continue to happen. So I don't think it's gonna have a real change in the way we use YouTube in the classroom. Mm. Uh, so I I'm not sure it's like that, that kind of a big change. Uh, not for teaching anyway. Well, it enables, uh, yeah, I'm not sure that people's actual practice will change much as regards YouTube, but it does, um, it does mean that, um, you know, for instance, you could do creative works with YouTube now more, more obviously. I mean, the way YouTube was architected was always really brilliant because embedding a video means that you don't have to, it doesn't trigger co copyright protection. Like everybody embeds YouTube videos on their site and that's not the same as copying it, right? So there really is no copying when you want to show. Or you're playing, you're performing it, right, in a classroom, and that, again, you're not making a copy, so you're not triggering copyright. But what you could do now with a lot of confidence is um, YouTube offers downloads now. You could download YouTube videos and mix them up together in some kind of creative format. You could even do scholarship with that. You could, you know. Well, Mike Weish at Kansas State said the students doing that for several years, and you could do some very interesting work you know, along the lines of this mashup stuff. Yeah. Uh, I mean, and also the it's the, the the fair use issues on this are entirely unenforceable because if it's on YouTube, who's going to come around and look in every single classroom at George Mason and say, "Wait, no, you can't be showing that." <laughs> that's that's entirely unenforceable, and because of the embedding, as you say, I'm not. If I embed something on a you know on a class blog, it's it's not violating the fair use. It's just saying, "Here's this video, and it's on this other website. Go look at it." I saw recently at uh, last fall at a undergraduate human human digital humanities <coughs> conference that I went to at, at Bryn Mawr in Haverford. I saw a student show a video essay he had done about the television show The Wire, and has someone who has taught, um, you know, film and television in the English classes, and you have to write the paper about the film and television. I the video essay was a real revelation to me. I was like, wow, if I ever were in a classroom again, assigning people to um, write, um, interpret, analyze video materials, they should do that in video form. And I happened to hear Michael Wesch speak at the University of Mary Washington recently, and he, he was in, you know, enthused about teaching people to edit video as you know, a basic skill of digital literacy. I mean, I get very enthused about teaching people to publish to the web as a basic skill well, of digital and, literacy. And the great thing about Mike's presentations about this is he doesn't teach people how to do that. He just shows them, he shows students video mashups and says, go do that. Go do that. And they do. And, and somebody, he was here last year, and somebody said, well, how much time do you spend teaching your students how to do this? And he said, none, I don't know how to do it. He knows how to do it. And so he said, I just told them to go do it. And he said, well, everything I know how to do, they've showed me how to do. So, uh, so it's really, you know, it's, it's not a skill that is, is that difficult for students who, grew up in this world where uh, these things were always there. Okay, well, we've got some stomach rumbling on Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, whoever that was, um, for your, We do have lunch waiting outside. I wanna thank everyone for joining us for this live edition of Digital Campus. And um, we will discuss some of the other issues that people brought up on Twitter. We want, they want us to have a night fight uh, over uh, Creative Commons different kinds of Creative Commons licensing. But you'll have to wait for that oh, yeah. for episode 71 of Digital Campus. Which will be live from Florida. The beach. <laughs> that sounds great. <laughs> All right, thanks everyone for joining us. <laughs> uh, thank you for our viewers on the telly. And thank you very much to Chris Pepperato, who yeah. has been our AV model.